He forgot the two one zero. <laughs> I'm sure he. <laughs> All righty. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm going to go ahead and it's nice to see some of you guys here. Uh, I'm here with Walt. Hello, Walt. Say hi, Walt. And then Roxana Marie uh, from Canada. Um, and we'll just get started as people start trickling in. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then uh, we'll just keep on keeping on. So let me just do that real quickly. All right. I wish it would get better. <laughs> cool. Oh, why, why is it doing it this way? Sorry, folks. Am I doing it right? There we go. Cool. Anyway, um, welcome back to User Experience Auckland. And for those of you who are new, uh, we are a design community here in Auckland, New Zealand. Or, and we've been doing this for uh, many years now. Um, we are part of the tech scene here in Auckland, which actually has a pretty big uh, commercial tech scene and product scene. Um, and uh, if you're new here, um, I want to tell you that there's a few things that are going on that you may participate in. Uh, so one of them is that we are on Discord. Uh, we are actually moving from our Slack server to a Discord server so that we can have more opportunities and more fun things to do as a community um, and have people um, participate and enjoy um, without just us always being that conduit to make that happen. This is the invite to get in there. If you are feeling, um, if you know Discord, you can just join with the, the MTKXNZNZJT or ZZ if you're in New Zealand, or just go ahead and use the QR code. But that's new for us. And uh, because of that, um, when you come in, uh, the first thing you're going to do is unlock the server by reading all our rules of how we'd like you to participate and behave in the server. Um, and then if you get a chance, pick your role. And if you do that, you sort of tell your story of what you do, where you're from, how long you've been doing it. And that's just to let other people also reach out to you and um, learn a little bit more about you before they talk to you in real life or at least in digital life. Uh, with that said, we are looking for people who would like to moderate in um, our Discord channel. Um, we're looking for people who um, want to be a, a moderator or design assets for Discord or be technical help for some of our YouTube channels um, or just be a social amplification. So we have um, just a forum that you can uh, fill out and we'll just contact you and bring you into the family of UXA. And what you get for it is um, when well, you get coaching, you get a great community, but you also get to do things that look good on your CV. And for um, people who don't have a lot of those things, new people or want to try something new, it's a great opportunity for you to participate in our community. Um, with that said, we're going into uh, what's called our Investment Friday Talks, which is Friday here in New Zealand, but our friend Roxana is actually in Canada, and it's Thursday. It's Thursday evening. <laughs> but this isn't um, really a new concept. There's been other companies that uh, have done this, and actually this was something I participated in at my company um, that I used to work for in Wellington, and it was really a way that um, we spent a little bit of time on our own projects or, or, or improving ourselves um, or working with other people. And the um, idea here is to have Friday talks that are virtual 
um, just to deal with issues with how the world is right now with COVID. We think that uh, being full-time virtual, sad but true, is going to have to work for us this year. Um, but we want to make sure that it's assess accessible to a lot of different types of people, actually people outside of Auckland. And so we're pretty excited about that. Um, and like I said, uh, when uh, my, when the company I used to work for did this, I think it was a really nice way for um, the, the, the colleagues to work together on, you know, on things maybe they didn't think about um, an idea or reading a book. And it was all about investing in yourself and, and learning and growing. And I think most people in the tech scene knows that you just don't get a job and, and you just do that job. You actually have to continually invest in yourself so you can grow skills and grow knowledge and um, do well in your job. And that is pretty much true, you know, across the tech scene in general. And that's kind of what UXA is all about is being that conduit to invest in yourself. Um, and with that, I will just say that one of the things we used to tell um, each other is um, if it's good, um, if it's if it's good for you, if it's good for your community or the world, then it's worth the time to invest. And so that's kind of our, our moniker for today, our, our tagline. With that said, and this is really how I've met um, um, Roxana, is that if you were looking for call for proposals for talks for Investment Fridays, um, maybe it's something you want to talk about. Maybe you know somebody that has a really good story that they want to share, but we um, have a Google form just for you to fill out and then we can start this journey. Um, so feel free to share it and feel free to, to um, fill it out if you have something. And I have to say, this is actually how I met uh, Roxana Maria. Uh, last year, she had filled out my um, call for proposal for our last year's event. And it was the start of a really nice a uh, friendship that we've created of just talking to each other over the past year, um, talking about the work that she's doing and um, really growing and really, really wonderful friendship. So I, it is my honor to actually introduce to you somebody that I um, admire and really love the work that she's doing um, for Macadamia and her name is Roxana Maria Barbu. I don't know if I said that right, uh, your last name. Oh, good. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just going to switch over to her and let her take it away. And I'll just be here uh, to help out. So there you go. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Nanny, for the wonderful, wonderful um, introduction. So indeed, Nanny and I met last year, and I've treasured every single conversation that we had and proof of that is my calendar would be like hey let's meet for half an hour and two hours and a half later okay it's bedtime for me it's almost <laughs> next day for you so yeah well my actual start hello from yesterday um because it's still Thursday here and I am going to Share my screen if I don't fail. There we go. I'm hoping everyone. Okay, I'm hoping that looks good on everyone's side. So it's, it really is my pleasure to speak with you today about a topic that's really dear to me, which is ethics or ethically responsible approaches. And I will, of course, I will start with a disclaimer because I am certainly not certified in any way or have a specific degree with an ethics specialization. Um, but I think, however, I do have a bit of a unique experience. Um, throughout the years, I've worked and conducted research in a plethora of environments. I've been in academia for quite a while. I've worked in hospitals. I've lived in fly-in First Nations reserves here in Canada, worked in greenhouses in Canada where seasonal migrant workers come from South America and had a language barrier. And my roots myself, I come from an itty bitty tiny village um, in Romania where at the time technology was science fiction. 
And most recently, as Nanny said, I am at the healthcare consultancy, Macadamia Technologies, where we work with all kinds of products and solutions. So working in all of these different environments, if I were to state one difference across all of them, is the degree to which ethical practices or standards exist or are enforced, or whether they have a strict regulatory body or they don't. So that's why I think having this conversation is really important. So before we jump right into ethics, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, this healthcare technology, oh, sorry, this healthcare consultancy, Macadamia Technologies, where I work, uh, we came up together with this title for myself, which is Behavior and Cognitive Experience Researcher, which is really, it's, it's really a bit of a mouthful, and I know that, but it's a good reflection of the way I approach my work. So when it comes to crafting products or experiences, we rely on people telling us something, or better yet, we conduct ethnographic research and we observe them in their actual environment. However, a lot of our decision-making is driven by subconscious aspects. And that's where the distinction between behavior and cognition comes in. That's where cognitive science or neuroscience comes in, into those processes that we don't have visibility into. So in my day-to-day, -day, I rely on these traditional UX methods and complement them with what I've learned and what I know from methods that you read your brain, so to speak, like EEG or fMRI, that allow us to talk about, to learn about unconscious processes. So today, I'm going to start with a few thoughts on ethics and then kind of what they are, how they can go really, really wrong. And then the second part will really focus on what can we as UX practitioners or researchers and designers do to, to advance this part and conclude with um, a very short takeaway. So I'm curious, what are the top words that come to mind when you think of ethics? So because I can't see the chat, Nanny, once in a while, I will rely on you as my co-creator to tell me what are the words that come to mind for you. And then if our audience wants to share, what are the words that come to mind for them when they think of ethics? Okay, sounds good. So what, what does ethics mean to you? What are the first words that pop in your head? Um, I think ethics for me is a, a set of principles of how I morally live my life or morally make some decisions or how I interact, you know, with people, things like that. Um, I think when I, <clears throat> I'm looking at, uh, at the chat and uh, somebody wrote about The Good Place as a, as a TV show that actually explores ethics, which I think is true. I haven't watched it. Um, and somebody else said it was situational, but they didn't get much more than that. I wish they would. Um, but yeah, cultural, thank you. Um, anybody else before I hand this back? Uh, somebody um, said anti-patterns. I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? I want to think of darn patterns, but I'm not sure if that's what they had in mind. I'd love to hear. Okay, fair enough. Um, Pack said respect. Ethics is respect. I think that's really great. Another person agreed with them. Yeah. I, I really like that. And I loved your definition because I think what really stands out for your from yours is the, the morals part, right? Um, which really, if it's something yeah. that you truly value, if it's a personal value, then it's a lot easier to act on it and to work towards the value. Apparently, someone's destroying my house. Is her name Luna? <laughs> no, I, I hope it's not her because that was far too loud. <laughs> So the definition, and I've spoken a few times on ethics, and every single time I struggle with what definition to use. Um, 
And this time around, I picked this one from Miriam Webster's um, dictionary. But the reason why I struggle is because so many definitions talk about morals, which I love. I love that you brought that up. And I personally really like that because if it's a personal value, we, it's easier to work towards it. But the, the concern I have with that one, and I think a few people already brought that up in the chat, is the subjectivity of it. Mm -hmm. Morals differ across individuals, even within the same individual over time. They differ across generations. They differ across cultures and so on. So this one says the meaning of ethic is the discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty. So it covers that component and obligation. So to me, for some reason, the word obligation or responsibility really resonated in kind of the environment we live in as complementary to morals. And I really hope that I managed to persuade you as we go through that as UX practitioners, we do have a grand responsibility or a grand obligation because the impact we have is huge or it, it can be huge. So Along with two colleagues at Macadamia, and we've co-created this framework. We refer to it as the ARC framework because, well, part of it, the visualization is a collection of ARCs, but really because our names are Alex, Roxana, and Carolyn. So we'll see more about the framework later. But what I wanted to share with you first is this foundational piece of the framework, which is the acknowledgement that products do not exist in isolation. In fact, there's this really intricate relationship between products, people, and their environments. And the first thing that came to mind was that kind of the foundation of UX, that people's needs, motivations, and environments should be accounted for when we're designing the right product. And that's a huge part of UX. But really, the other part of it is kind of looking at it the other way around is how the products themselves end up affecting the people. Because there, there can be unintended consequences. There can be contexts that are changing or shifting or other people end up using the product for something that we have not intended. So we design it with the people's needs and environments in mind, but we need to take a step back and continue following it throughout its journey to see what happens later on. So to do that, I think it's really important to look at the larger picture, not just ethics in design, for example, but really ethics in a product's journey. So, and I'm, I'm using the word journey really um, on purpose here because ethics needs to be considered in all phases from ideation, all throughout research, design, development, and beyond. So, it's important to see what happens when the product is out there. And the, the tricky part there, and I, I wonder, we can speak about this more at the end, but I'm really curious how people do this because, for example, at the consultancy, once the product is out there or we've done, I'm the researcher, I've done my part, I'm not even in the game anymore. So what does that mean? How do we contribute at that part? And we, we look at those unintended, potentially unintended consequences once the product is released in the wilderness, so to speak. So I really want to kind of put the dot on the eye with the gravity or the obligation or how important ethics can be. So as I mentioned, I've presented this topic several times, but the time that has stayed with me has been with our VP of user experience, Jennifer Fraser, who shared with me an experience with everyone really, an experience she had while in architecture school. And I want to share that story with you as well. I do have to advise you, the story relates to concentration camps. So if you're feeling vulnerable right now, or that's not something you want to hear, please feel free to um, mute me for the next two slides. So I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the evidence room. Um, Robert Jan Van Pelt, the exhibition principal um, and a professor at the university here in Canada, describes this installation as containing the evidence of the greatest crime ever committed by architects. 
So it contains a series of full-scale plaster of reproductions of objects from Auschwitz, a gas column, gas type door, gas type hatch, um, 60 casts of architectural evidence, including blueprints, contractors' bills, and photographs. And Jennifer has met Feld. He was doing research in the archives, looking at architectural documentation of the camps, and I, I think they refer to this as forensic architecture. But looking at these blueprints, he analyzed the revisions. So the camps have started as inter uh, basically just camps where uh, places to keep prisoners of wars, which included a crematorium as people would die whether it's from injuries, from illnesses, um, and the people running the camp needed a way to dispose of the dead. So it, it makes sense, it was logical that a crematorium was included as part of the blueprint. But then with revisions to the working drawings, Van Pelt could see how, how the intention evolved. So initially it was a shoot for the bodies to be dead bodies to be um, dropped there. And the Jacko was the architect of record on the drawings. And with the addition of lines to turn that shoot into a stair, that draft person has changed the architecture of that camp from a place to dispose of bodies to a place to murder them. So Van Pelt has felt that this act of drawing those lines should wait on the moral conscience of all architects. And I know I have not relayed the story as well as Jennifer would, um, but her story profoundly impressed me and really emphasized the gravity of our decisions. And I wanted to share it with you as well. I would have rather to do this not on camera and in, in the same room, but here we go. So, um, Moving on to a quote from yet another person who really inspires me, uh, Kim Goodwin. Ideally, as a practice, we have do not harm as the first tenant of work. And having done research with humans within academia for every project, I had to do ethics proposals, get approvals, even for what I think were completely non-invasive or not scary or dangerous in any way. Like I've done lang language studies um, to see, you know, differences or universality of language. So I would ask things like, what are the participants or the things involved when you hear the verb to eat? I don't know, or to draw or to write and see whether people across the globe, I did Spanish, English, Romanian, and Turkish, um, have the same concept of these verbs. Like what's the universality of language? Really, there was nothing invasive in that, but I've done ethics proposals for that and I had to get permission. Similar situations in the hospital, even longer and more complex ethics proposals. So my work environment, many work environments have this strict code of ethics, but UX professionals, though we work with humans and create with and for humans, we don't typically need to get an ethics approval from a re um, regulatory body. And that's a bit terrifying. And um, one of the other points that she raises is this idea of the internet basically constantly being the biggest interventional study ever, which is mostly unconsented. So every time a company decides to do A-B testing such that some of us see one thing and the others see something else. And oftentimes it can, if, it, if it's about, let's say, um, you know, sales or something like that, and some people see access to it and others don't, things like that are not fair. Similarly, the tone of voice in some messages versus others that can play into people's emotions and mental health and so on. So all of these are unconsented experiments. So I know this section has been heavy, but I really think it kind of, th this is a good summary, given the rapid pace at which advanced technologies are developed and the vast consequences that they can have. I am just a, and fill in the blanks, US researcher, architect, designer, analyst, data scientist is no longer an acceptable excuse. 
If we're contributing to creating a product in any manner, we are responsible for its effects on others. So now I will quickly go over a handful of examples where ethically responsible practices may have been violated. I'll, uh, I'll let you decide for that one. So have you, if, I'm not sure if you've heard of this company, Clearview. What they did is that they scraped people's photos from social media sites in order to identify them in other photos. And then they sold their technology to law enforcement agencies. I'd love to hear your thoughts, ethical or not ethical. I hope we're all on the same page. We did talk about cultural differences, but you never know. So um, everybody um, in the chat, do you mind answering um, Roxana's question, whether that was ethical or not ethical? Absolutely not. <laughs> not ethical. No way. Yeah, I am really hoping that says it for all of us. So this graph on the right illustrates how many photos can be searched with law enforcement, whether it's Los Angeles police, Florida police, FBI, and how many can be searched with a clear view. And I'll let the graph do the talking on this one. And really, one thing that I want to kind of emphasize is that as we move towards very rapidly to this fully digital age, bad design decisions. So let's say, you know, a chair ends up being bad. Maybe that's a terrible example, but one person hurts themselves. But when we talk about the digital age, all of these bad decisions or unethical ones get amplified because of the digital component. So this is, um, I won't spend too much time here, but this is just a quote from the founder of Clairview, which kind of as I read it, it seems to normalize this behavior. That's because Facebook and other social media sites prohibit people from scraping images. Clearview is violating the site's terms of um, service. A lot of people, and th th his response to that was, a lot of people are doing it, Facebook knows. So that's kind of, to me, it's normalizing and accepting that behavior. Similarly with this one, I've come to the conclusion that because information constantly increases, there's no, never going to be privacy. I personally am not ready to accept that. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not ready. Uh, but you know, I was gonna, I was gonna say if I can jump in, this is course. one thing about I think capitalism as the under, you know, as this framework of how we live our lives that we trade our time for money, um, and we we um, look for companies as the place that we get our work. And then what those companies do is to try to make products, you know, that make them money. I, I, I don't know many products who decide, uh, we're just going to make a product because it's Friday. You know, they, they want to, when I, when I talk to a lot of people, why you do a thing, you know, it is to make money and, or it's to make these things. And so they, I think tell themselves a little bit, oh, it's okay to do that. Everybody shares this information. I'm just being smart. I'm just using that that thing that you give freely as a way to make money. And, and you can support that because that's what our system does. You know, so it's a little bit of that sometimes, I think. Anyway, continue on. No, I, I'm happy you share that, and it definitely resonates with me and with the, well, I think it resonates pretty well with the next example. So the second example is about Practice Fusion, a company founded in 2005, and it's known for its unique model of providing free, ad-supported health records, um, software to independent doctors. It's used in roughly 30, or last time I checked, roughly 30,000 practices. So what happened was that a pop-up would appear asking about the patient's level of pain, then a drop-down menu would list treatments ranging from 
um, referral to a pain specialist all the way to prescription for an opioid painkiller. So you'd click a button and the program would create a treatment plan. And from 2016 to 2019, the alert went off 230 million times. So the tool existed thanks to a secret deal. So its maker, a software company called Practice Fusion, was paid off by a major opioid manufacturer to design it in such a way um, that kind of as an effort to boost prescriptions for addictive pain pills, even though overdose deaths had almost tripled during the prior 15 years. So that partnership of designing with an, a specific effort of boosting prescriptions for addictive pain kills. That, yeah. And in 2016, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put out new guidelines on opioids and treating patients with chronic pain. So these guidelines emphasize non-drug and non-opioid alternatives. So when opioids were prescribed, um, quicker acting versions were preferable. Um, so basically, the, the practice fusion reported to the drug company in 2016, the project was working as intended, shifting prescriptions to the company's extended release opioids. So they shared those guidelines internally, but did not incorporate recommendations contained in those guidelines. And my third example, uh, this one's really interesting because it, it kind of emphasizes how it, sometimes the consequences of our designs are immediate and we can kind of act on them, but sometimes they can be years and years later. And that's a lot harder to control. So this one is an example of secondary data. Um, this Danish general practitioners database was developed around 2005 by a small group of pioneering general practitioners who they kind of led the way in that digitizing medical records and worked really hard to introduce what they call data-driven quality development and general practice. So the intention was good. The outcome was good at the time. The intention was to have GPs, um, general practitioners, have more visibility into the effectiveness of treatments. So, you know, each um, practitioner, let's say if they treat 20 people with diabetes with possibly slightly different treatments, they would know what worked best in then small group of 20, which is not great from a statistical perspective to, to make a conclusion which one's best. But having that openness and sharing of data across practitioners, having that visibility would lead to more accurate conclusions about which treatments work best. So that was clearly at the benefit of the patient. But in time, uh, things really changed. So secondary analysis, if you're not familiar with it, is basically having an original set of data collected for a specific purpose and then using it for very different purposes later on. And at first sight, this can seem intuitive and practical because, you know, you don't bother people the second time around. Some more than one good can come out of it and so on, but it can end up having unintended consequences. So going back to this list here on the right side, we see how the purpose of the data or what is being used for evolved over time. At first glance, you know, we're, we're seeing things like quality development in general practice, resources for research, all the way to uh, motor of national economic growth in 2013. I don't know about you, but they sound positive to me. Just looking at the first, I don't, right away, I don't see anything um, dangerous in that or negative. But as the scope expanded, a few things has, have happened. So for example, in an attempt to standardize or automate the diagnosis coding, some patients were ended up being at home looking on the portal and reading diagnosis that they have never heard from their doctor. 
So if you read something like that, depending on what you what you're going through um, or what that diagnosis may be, it could have terrible, terrifying consequences. Um, not all translations were equally successful, and even the physicians themselves were surprised by some of the algorithmic-led mm -hmm. translations, particularly the ones around um, mental health. Some were mistakenly translated into diagnosis of pyromania. Like No one wants to read that. And another part of it, another unintended consequence was that at some point, the project was given the working title, The Snitch, because even though originally it was intended as um, helping the patients, it kind of turned around so that citizens would log in and check whether doctors were cheating and inform the authorities. Basically, if the doctor had billed services which patients haven't received, and I'm not saying that was good or bad, I'm just saying it was a really interesting move and how it evolved from the system that was designed to improve patient care was now inverted and seen as a tool that would allow patients to single out doctors who may not adhere to um, billing guidelines. And that process was not set for that, right? So that doesn't mean it was accurate. So, so far we've kind of, we've seen these unthinkable consequences of design, how with a few lines, the Jacko changed the architecture of a room from a place to keep people to a place of murder. We've seen ethical practices go wrong at the expense of patient risk, like in patient fusion. Um, and really any ethics centered discussions are complex and I do not claim to have the answer. But I think a lot of these problems are stem part of it from a disregard of ethics and the other part, because there's a lack of regulatory body. So that's kind of why I like having these conversations for us to decide together, how do we change this? What are these approaches? So I'll tell you my thoughts. I think one path to creating solutions that people really want is by conducting user research. So I know I'm in a full in a room full of experts, so I'm not going to dwell much on this. I just want to quickly go through a few stages and tell you from my experience kind of where trouble comes a knocking. Um, so for one, many people still think of user experience as the surface, the tip of the iceberg, the visual design. And Visual design, of course, is a key element to user experience, but for a product to be meaningful to its target users, it has to be something that people want or need, and that search has to start far beneath the, sur the surface. So I think for us to lead to meaningful ethical products, we need to advocate for the importance of research and all of the layers that come with it, enough time, enough budget, inclusivity in people that we recruit and so on. So doing our due diligence from the beginning, starting with strategy and scope and working all the way up to the surface ensures that our offering indeed meets users' needs and is free of usability and accessibility challenges. And really from a financial perspective, businesses want that too, right? Like they don't want a product that um, ends up failing we just need to advocate for it because making those revisions early on don't come with a huge financial time and cost, but going to market and fully failing, that's a totally different story. And also in-depth discoveries, I think that's where we learn how the product, so think back to that um, person, product, environment loop. I think in these early stages in in-depth discoveries, we learn where a product fits in the larger ecosystem, and that's where we can learn about its impact at scale. So this is just a more granular view, but all this to say is we should not underestimate the role that in-depth research can have in ensuring our products are aligned with the need to improve experiences. So if we do our due diligence and we conduct all this research and we go through all those phases, is that enough? What else can we do? 
So let's talk about a few other practical steps because conducting research can be quite vague. So I wanted to kind of show a few considerations along the entire product journey. So here are 10 considerations. Nani, I'll ask for your help again, just for time sake. Um, some of these are more intuitive than others, so we may not have time to talk through all of them. So you and the audience tell me which ones, which ones we should dive into. What's the first that speaks to you? Um, I will ask people to say in the chat what, what they suggest, but I think inclusivity is something that I've been uh, talking about lately. Um, I think anybody who follows me on Twitter might have seen, I, I did a thing about how we how we include, uh, how we describe people to sign up for a certain thing. So why don't we, why don't we try that one? Yeah, I think that one. And that one is, yeah. Oh no, somebody also said consent. That was my second one. So okay. how's Perfect. those? Okay. So inclusivity, I think that one is huge and it's a bit scary, right? Because I think inclusivity and accessibility to some degree go hand in hand. And it is our responsibility to design for everyone. And I have a colleague who, uh, Larry, if you're listening, who did a presentation this Wednesday specifically on that and the importance of us understanding, because let's say you have budget for 30 people, you can't recruit people with all kinds of um, abilities along the spectrum and all kinds of different needs and all kinds of races that that's more than 20 right so or more than 30 so what do you do and that's that's our opportunity one to see to really brainstorm and understand and bring experts in to say okay maybe I'm dealing with an ultrasound what kind of things are related to a person's ability to use an ultrasound it could be body shape it could be um, it could be weight, right? Because those machines are standard size typically. And I mean, I'm tall. I've been in machines where like I just, they kept moving me and my feet were kicking out um, like fMRI boxes or whatever it is, you know? So just brainstorming what are the elements that are more re most related to the use of that product and then recruiting inclusively from that. Because otherwise, there is, of course, a limitation in number of people. Then the other part to complement that is bringing in experts who understand more generally um, particular needs and how they translate into a product. Admitting when we don't have that ability in-house within the company and bringing in the right experts. Because I've seen far too many companies trying to do that internally, but without having a dedicated team. And if we're dealing with visual impairments or anything like that, right? Like there's a lot to test. There's a lot of needs, um, tools, all these things that we can't pretend that just because we have the right intention, we can do it right. So acknowledging our limitations. And I think that kind of feeds into humility and bringing in the right, um, the right people. Uh, the second one was consent. I'm glad you guys brought that up because I, that's also my, that was my first one. I think informed consent, I love this quote, informed consent process is the cornerstone of ethics. I really like it because it resonates. I've worked in many fields and it resonates with all of them. Um, but what does it mean really? What does it mean to agree? What is consent? And the officially and widely agreed definition says that the person agrees to participate in a study willingly with no coercion. That's a bit more granular than just I agree on a page, but let's unpack it even more. So I think there's a few key elements to ensure consent is done right. And um, it's plain language, time to reflect, coercion free, and consent now and or in the future if applicable. So um, <laughs> this art installation shows the terms and conditions from social media. Needless to say, most of us would never read it word by word, but we can't just hide behind the terms and conditions. So what do we do? 
Well, even if we were to read the word by word, chances are we wouldn't understand all of it. And this is a snapshot from the terms of an agreement from uh, Maple Story, which is intended for 10 plus. I mean, albeit it should be the parents reading this, not, not the, the child, but it says you waive any rights to paternity. The first thing to buy, I was like, what does that even mean? It made no sense. And of course, I Googled it and now I know what it means. But the idea is one cannot provide consent if they don't understand the words. So to address this, there's two practices that I've been using. One is using plain language. And when I say plain, I mean plain. Like in Canada, I think it's grade eight level. In US, is grade five level. So if you have siblings or kids around you who are in grade school, they are the people to test the informed consent forms with and the NDA forms and everything that goes to a participant. To truly test consent, just ask the first kid around you to see if they understand every word. That's the real test for providing consent that or consent form that people can understand. And I do that. I do that with my little brother. Because it's really hard to make sense of, and okay, sometimes if we're talking about like legal cybersecurity or some things, like there's some things you can't translate to a grade five level equally or medical terminology where you're trying to translate the diagnosis to grade five, it doesn't quite work. So in those cases, um, don't add the pressure of making a decision on the spot send the forms in advance, advise your potential participants to reach out and ask for help. Make sure they can express that freedom that they can call you, they can ask you, they can run it through other people to make sure that that they do understand it by the time they actually sign it and encourage them to not sign until they understand. If I can, if I can just jump in here because there's something going on in chat, and I, I would say this anyway. You know, from a UX point of view, that um, sometimes you have to. Uh, I think with things like that, I always recommend give short a short blurb, like a progressive disclosure. Right, you give a short blurb at the top, bullet points. Say this is the main things that you are that's in this document. If you want to see more. There it is. And maybe you just have one. Here's more. Here's your lawyer version, you know, so you can, you know, give it to somebody else like that. But um, last week there was a, uh, it was UXNZ in Wellington. And uh, one of the pre- presentation presenters, um, Bill Balactus, do you know him? He does a lot of speculative design. Um, and uh, he was just talking about that as well. So it kind of, you know, works well, it dovetails into your talk as well. That's good to hear. And the other part of it is coercion free. I think this one's really, really hard. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, on a university campus, there's posters, we all know on campuses or when we were on campus, posters everywhere. And people in university go through ethics, like those posters for st- advertising studies They're advertising ethics approved studies on every wall. So nothing wrong there. And one of these studies um, was paying $75. That was a year back, a few years back. I was, I think, in my master's when when I've seen things like this um, to test out a VR game experience. That, That sounds pretty fun, right? So the study passed all the ethics requirements. It was truly by the book. Um, nothing, nothing wrong. The researchers haven't done anything wrong. No obvious risks associated with it. So a first year student, curious, decides to participate because the form was very clear. They understood every word. Um, but then towards within the description of it, it said that the game involved flying. It was virtually, it was VR. It happened to be flying. Well, the student has happened to lose someone in a plane crash and they no longer wanted to do it. But at the same time, they happened to come from a low income family. Their budget was $17, $18 a week for food, which at the time was not very much. So $75 was a lot of money. And doing that quick math, well, how many weeks can I cover? Um, The student decided to participate. 
and that's invisible coercion. From the researchers' side, there was nothing that they officially done wrong. There was no explicit coercion. There was it was fully invis invisible coercion because of the person's circumstances, and that particularly when we worked in um, with different minorities or with people with subjects that may have a vulnerable implication, we need to make sure, or to the best of our abilities, we need to look for these sources of invisible coercion. So one way, yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, that's one of the things with testing, whenever you do usability testing and you are giving a stipend or you're, you're compensating for the time, you know, part of that conversation up front is you pay them first before you even go through um, the test in case it gets uncomfortable, in case they have to leave, because it's not really, you, you can't hold the carrot to the end and make them do those mm -hmm. things to give, you know, you have to just say, okay, you agreed to do this. Here's, here's for your time. Let's get started. Whether they complete or not, you, you just, I think it's just a, a, a good approach to doing um, usability testing in that format. Yeah, I think that's a great approach. I love that. I will add that as, uh, to my list of proposed solutions. One thing that I've been doing is um, compensate people with, per, um, with donations to a charitable organization in their name. So then it's a bit easier, I think, to say, I no longer want to participate. But of course, reinforcing that they can step out at any point, I think that's huge. So if we've done the informed consent form right, you know, that can go a very long way. But what else can we do? And I promised you at the beginning, I'll talk a little bit about the ARC framework. So along with those principles towards ethically responsible practices, I just want to review a few behavior change principles. And the reason I want to do this is because one of the buzzwords of the year has been gamification. And to some, to, depending on how you define it and whose definition you use, that can also mean addiction to a product or platform, whether or not the product is meaningful. So these 13 principles, I'm hoping they're very intuitive, but the idea is that they can, if you follow all of them, they lead to creating a product that is meaningful rather than having those addictive elements. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to quickly review only a handful. Um, so trust, credibility, and transparency is the idea that the app should really, or the product should really conduct in good faith only things that are necessary and use it to the benefit of the person. And uh, I mean, for their benefit, we should also know that they're doing that because if an app does it and another doesn't, and we don't know that the first one does it, then there's no difference from our behavior. So it has to be reflected in design as well. So the way it can be reflected, this is one example. Headspace is an app um, that promises to help people meditate, but many apps promise that, right? So what's different? What's different is that this app is science-informed, backed up by current clinical trials, so by institutions with a very clear regulatory body. So there's that trust element that you know they will risk. First of all, there's a trust element that is science-informed, so it will work. But there's also a trust element that they won't do anything really mean or bad or unethical with your data because they have all these um affiliations with places that have very strict ethics. So that's one way to show that credibility and trust through design. And another one, I really like this one because we I think it's complementary to that I agree installation with terms and agreements that go forever and ever and ever. Um, LifeWorks, which is an app for companies to invest in their employees' wellness, when they go through these... Um, agreement parts, it's really interesting. They have these subtitles such as feeling connected, rewarded, surfaced into content snippets rather than buried into terms and agreements. 
So this, to me, is a really good counterexample to that long, no one will ever read, very few will understand terms of agreement. So it breaks it down. It breaks. It, I think that's kind of what you were saying about the informed consent form, is breaking it down in bite-sized sections that people can actually understand and are willing to read. And I think this one's huge, and I think this one may be the last one I'm covering, but engagement mechanisms are really important to achieve engage to basically adoption and retention. But the way we do it may lead to unethical practices. So if you think of hotels or stores, online stores that say there's only one left, buying now, really pushing towards that fear of missing out, or even grocery stores that say during COVID, if they do have enough stock, but they show that empty shell shelf for a few days or for a few hours, kind of saying, hey, we don't have enough, suggesting towards that scarcity on purpose when maybe they do have enough and then you overbuy. I'd say that's really not an ethical approach, but there are ethical ones. So this is a positive example. And there are several reasons I like this one. Um, journaling is a very effective cognitive technique. So I, I see this in really good apps. But another part that I really like about it is that it can promote app or product independence, particularly in a fully digital world. Well, they teach you about the technique, but there's nothing to say that at some point, if needed, you stop doing it in the app. You take a pen and paper or a notebook and you move away from the screen. And I really respect products that also give you the option to not be addicted, that encourage you and teach you to become app independent. And I have one last one. I'll go really quickly over this one. Um, sometimes when people buy, like we buy a product, right? And we need it for a while, but at some point, we may not need it anymore, and that should be okay. However, I'm sure you've all experienced at least one example when you're desperately trying to cancel a product or a subscription you no longer need, and it really shouldn't be that hard. Um, so, of course, letting people go on their separate ways, let's, let's do that as a best practice. But there are some examples where a relationship could continue after the user has met their primary goal. So I'll show you one of my favorite ones. This is a period app. So let's say use it for a while, maybe something's going on in your life, irregular periods, use it for a while, then everything goes back to regular. Um, and you, there's no, technically there should be no reason why you keep the app. But what they do is um, they, provide you, provide users this opportunity to contribute to something much bigger. There is not a lot of research around the menstrual cycle. And what they're doing is they're trying to change that. So they fund research, they provide data with your permission and anonymized clinical trials. And it's exclusively used for this kind of research around the world. So in this case, even when it served its primary purpose to many of us, it provides another meaningful incentive to stay and continue using it as opposed to annoying me because I can't cancel the subscription. And with that, I just want to acknowledge um, that we've been through a lot. So my take home message is really, really short. I just want us to keep on reflecting revising because the things I've put forward are not the end all be all and there's always a learning opportunity and I'm grateful to do it across countries and repeat these conversations with other speakers, other cultures, other audiences and keep on growing. Um, there's this quote that I really like from Donella Meadows. She says, invite others to challenge your assumptions and add their own. So that's what I would like to invite you to do. And here's just a link to a post on ethics that Jennifer and I wrote a while back. Thank you. Ah, I wish I could see some faces. Actually, it's funny you say that. Thank you for, for doing this. I wonder, do you have any more time? Because 
what I suggest, especially with the people that are still here, let's just jump into a voice channel on our Discord and continue the conversation a few more minutes and people can ask you some questions directly. Does that sound good, people on the on the uh, on the on the chat? If so, just come into our Discord and I don't know, do you have our Discord as well? I, I had it somewhere on my email, but do you mind there we go? Uh, there's the chat. So um I will for those stay here until I'm successful. Yeah, so hey, thanks guys for coming. If you can't come, that's fine. But those who want to stay for a little bit just to uh, meet up with Roxana and ask her a few, couple questions, jump in the voice channel and let's just spend a few more minutes doing that, probably like five or 10 more minutes, okay? Otherwise, cheers. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's making me select buses. Hopefully this goes through timely. Some great, uh, some great uh, comments, by the way, that people thought was really insightful, which is, I know this is some of the conversations we've been